Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Living legend Dick Van Dyke has spent more than seven decades in show business. And at 98 years young, his work is still resonating with audiences. Is there one thing that people say to you that gets to you that makes you say, oh, I did this right? I'm on my third generation. I'm getting letters from little kids. And that is what I love, that they watch the movies over and over. No, I'm getting so much more mail today than I did during the heyday of my career. Later in the show, Dick Van Dyke on the joy of performing on stage. Talk about laughter. How important is that? It's very important. If I can't laugh, <laughs> I don't know what I'd do. Then someone just asked me, what do you prefer? What medium? And I said, the theater. Because the audience is there. You get an immediate response. And they do half the, the work, really. Whatever the audience does kind of dictates what you're going to do next. And I just love the theater, and because of the laughter. Then, from Dick Van Dyke's enduring career to that of a toy inventor who's also been honing his craft for decades, Luke Burbank introduces us to the man behind some of the most popular toys of the last 70 years. You might say Eddie first cut his teeth in the toy industry, quite literally with an invention you're probably familiar with. This is what it does. Yes, Eddie Goldfarb invented those wind-up chattering teeth, which are technically called yakety yak. I mean, could you have ever imagined this would be something that no, defined your life? absolutely not, absolutely not. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Dick Van Dyke has done it all, acting, dancing, and singing. You may think his magical career is in its twilight, but he shows few signs of slowing down, as I saw firsthand. Oh yeah, he still got it. At 98, Dick Van Dyke still sings with his group, the Fantastics, and still makes it all look easy. That was great. I didn't even know they were coming. How important is it that you're having fun? when you're doing it. That's my whole career has depended on that. If I'm not enjoying myself, I'm really bad. I am. It's such a blessing to find a way of making a living that you love, that you do for nothing. I feel so sorry for people who hate their jobs. I look forward to going to work every morning. And some of his work helped define a generation. Take The Dick Van Dyke Show. It ran for five years on CBS, and it was such a hit that they're bringing it back. Sort of. Ladies and gentlemen. CBS will air a two-hour tribute. Dick Van Dyke, 98 years of magic. And for the occasion, they even recreated the original Dick Van Dyke Show set, down to that well-known ottoman. The famous living room is an example of mid-century modern design, but the scripts, had no reference to the time period at all. No pop culture, no slang, no politics. They wanted the Dick Van Dyke show to be like the man himself, timeless. Early in his career, Van Dyke was quoted as saying he only wanted to make films his children could watch. That got the attention of Walt Disney, who promptly cast him in Mary Poppins. Bad Cockney accent and all. And his next few films were equally family friendly, like this one, which was based on a book by James Bond creator Ian Fleming. From then on, Van Dyke was almost always typecast as the good guy. Did you miss out on some big parts? Uh, yeah, I, I could have been James Bond. You could have been James Bond? Yep. Yeah. When uh, Sean Connery left, the producer said, Do you, would you like to be the next Bond? I said, have you heard my British accent? Click. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> That's a true story. Chief, I am a candidate for mayor. Dick Van Dyke's career went on, of course. He made more movies and more TV shows. What have I got here? An elephant. An elephant. <laughs> 
He also survived alcoholism and built a body of work that has yet to be finished. Is there one thing that people say to you that gets to you that makes you say, oh, I did this right? I'm on my third generation. I'm getting letters from little kids. And that is what I love, that they watch the movies over and over. No, I'm getting so much more mail today than I did during the heyday of my career. It seems that in showbiz, the true legends never stop. Just look at this interview from 2017 with his friends Norman Lear and Carl Reiner. There's something about 90, hitting 90. <laughs> I know I can get uh, applause just standing up. <laughs> People are uh, more afraid of aging than they are death these days. And they don't, we need to tell them there's a lot of good living to do. The last time that I sat down and had a long conversation with you, it was with Norman on one side and Carl. Yes, my two favorite human beings. Yeah. <laughs> and they're both gone both now. Both gone, yeah, I can't believe it. Is it hard to wrap your mind around that? Yes. Well, everybody I knew and worked with, there's no one left. How do you deal with that? Well, I try not to by making new friends and, you know, getting involved in a lot of things. I try to keep busy. So I know you think about this. Do you think about why you're still around? As I've said, if I had known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> yeah, because I went through that whole period of alcoholism. <clears throat> but my wife, God bless her, makes sure that I go to the gym three days a week and do a full workout. And then I do these. And his workouts are pretty legendary, as Anthony Mason saw in 2021. But it's kept him going and going. You wrote something in, in your autobiography. Don't be scared of dying. Be more frightened that you haven't finished living. That was a good quote I said. Get your living done first. And have the nerve to try something. Failure's OK. I read something about you. You do the New York Times crossword in pen. Yeah. What does that say about you? <laughs> that I'm very confident. <laughs> Still, the taping of his special left him pretty speechless. This is just mind-blowing. I can't I have any words, you know, it just, yeah, I mean, it's past my bedtime, not even sleeping. <laughs> With his wife Arlene at his side, it was a tribute to a remarkable life that even he still can't believe is his. You never planned any of this? No, I never did. As a businessman, I'm not much good. I would do a movie or something and come home and just sit down and wait for the phone to ring. I wasn't aggressive. So I, do, I was out of work a lot because I didn't go out and look for it. And how did that sit with you? Uh, well, I didn't mind it. <laughs> I'm pretty lazy, really. When I'm having fun, you know, all right. But I'm, I'm a lazy person. Really? Not, not a lot, I don't have a lot of drive. I've been very lucky. Wow. <laughs> Always somebody to pick me up and put me over there. <laughs> That's wonderful. It just, it just sort of happened. It did. It just happened. Absolutely. And then, right in front of us, this happened. He started singing again, and the weight of nearly a hundred years fell away. And Dick Van Dyke was what he's always been, a happy kid. When you find the joy of living is loving and giving, you'll be the when the wind he dies and toss a toss. A smile is just a frown that's turned upside down. So smile and that frown will be frost, be frost. And don't forget to keep your fingers crossed. Ba -dum -dum. Yeah! <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from my chat with Dick Van Dyke, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. Stay with us. In those rehearsals, I learned that I could dance, and it was like learning to fly. I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> As promised, here's more from my conversation with Dick Van Dyke. You've said you're a fake when it comes to the, dancing. Well, I never trained. I never danced before, and when I, I auditioned for Bye Bye Birdie, 
uh, I was out of work, looking for work. I did uh, a little Ray Bolger song, Once in Love with Amy, and I did a little bit of a soft shoe. And Gower Champion came up and said, you have the part. I said, I don't dance. He said, I'll teach you. And he did. In those rehearsals, I learned that I could dance. And it was like learning to fly. I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> and quite well. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the key is to dancing well? Well, I was always limber, you know, and fast on my feet. I was a, a, a really good track and field performer. And I just, I had the, uh, something. I had a lot of lift. <laughs> you sure did. Yeah. Do you think part of it might have been that you weren't trained? I think it, it made it look different. It was like no one else ever no. had before. <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't look like a trained, it wasn't anything repetitive about it. And I think maybe that made it interesting. Talk about l laughter. How important is that? It's very important. If I can't laugh, <laughs> I don't know what I'd do. Then someone just asked me, what do you prefer, what medium? And I said, the theater. Because the audience is there. You get an immediate response. And they do half the, the work, really. Whatever the audience does kind of dictates what you're going to do next. And I just love the theater. And because of the laughter. You feed off the oh, how the yeah. audience responds. Exactly. They don't realize they're doing part of the work, but they are. If you don't have an audience, how are you? Not as good. We had the, the Van Dyke show, we had an audience. But in, mostly in the movies, you don't have. So I play to the crew, whoever. I got to get, somebody's got to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, we should talk about Arlene, because aside from good genes and keeping moving, you also have Arlene. Yes. And I, uh, I, I love women, but I was always scared to death of them. I just, girls just made me nervous from the beginning. I never hit or introduced myself to a strange woman ever. We were at a, uh, in the green room at a, an at award show, and she walked by, and I found myself, I jumped up and said, hi, I'm Dick. I don't know what did that. And I got her to sit down, found out she was a makeup artist, and hired her, and courted her, and it just keeps getting better. So somebody was looking over, you know, how could all that happen by chance? I don't believe that. She made my life great, keeping me young. I was offered a few things that I thought I should do. It's funny that the, anything serious I did never did much. I did the comic about a silent... Which is a uh, wonderful, wonderful I'm movie. I'm really proud of that. It was authentic. But a lot of people didn't see that. And I did one about an alcoholic called The Morning After. The Morning After. Yeah, and not too many people watch that. People don't want to see me be serious. They see you be serious. I think that's you, it. But The Morning After is fascinating because you were very open about your struggles with alcohol right. early on. And you could have kept it hidden. It wasn't like it was affecting your work that people could really see it. Yeah. Why did you decide to talk about it? It just seemed like it was a, a subject that was kept so quiet. I thought... If I told my story, people who were suffering from it would identify. And it turned out that that movie was shown at all the uh, rehabilitation centers around the country. It became a standard. So uh, a lot of people say they got sober because of it. Wow. So I'm happy about that. That's got to be great to hear that. It that is. It you, is. It, it yeah, worked. Yeah, and somebody said, I got sober when I saw your movie because it didn't have a happy ending. It, the guy didn't get sober. Yeah, and then if people knew that you struggled with that in real life, yeah, how powerful is that? Yeah, just sharing the story, I think, did a lot of good. I'm proud of it. Up next, toying around. Welcome back. Inventor Eddie Goldfarb has been designing toys and games since his days in the Navy during World War II. Luke Burbank plays around with the man behind some of our childhood favorites. If you had a toy or game that you really loved any time in the last 70 or so years, there's a decent chance you've got Eddie Goldfarb to thank for it. Are you thinking about inventions? 
even now? Oh, yes, I'm working on uh, two or three right now. Yes, at age 102, Eddie Goldfarb is still inventing, adding to his list of over 800 toys. I believe if you do creative work of any kind, if you start with nothing and end with something, it stimulates your brain, and I think that's very good for your body. Growing up in Chicago in the 1920s, Goldfarb believed he would someday be an applied physicist. But lacking the money for college, he joined the Navy and fought on the USS Batfish submarine during World War II. When he wasn't dodging depth charges, he was in his bunk, jotting down ideas for toys to invent. He figured they might be cheap to manufacture. Toys was going to be just a beginning. I realized that if I invented a successful game, it could sell a million units in one year easily. I had a million families got together. And I realized that the toy industry is a noble industry. And you might say Eddie first cut his teeth in the toy industry, quite literally, with an invention you're probably familiar with. This is what it does. Yes, Eddie Goldfarb invented those wind-up chattering teeth, which are technically called yakety yak. I mean, could you have ever imagined this would be something that no, defined your absolutely, life? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Despite the millions of sets of teeth that have been sold over the years, Eddie made just $900 when he sold the rights to them back in 1949. But he's not mad, he says. He got something valuable with the money. I needed an overcoat. <laughs> it, was, it was really cold in Chicago. <laughs> he did, though, learn a lesson, which was to hang on to those royalty rights of his other inventions, including what he says was his biggest seller, the mini 4x4 replicas known as Stompers. Stomper! But it was when we sat down to play a game of Kerplunk, which he also invented, that Eddie admitted something. Uh, I invented so many games, I never played them. I think people would be very surprised to hear that because it would seem like you must have been sort of like a Willy Wonka, like very childlike and, and playing the games all the time. You're saying no, that wasn't the case? No, I was too busy inventing them. Growing up in a house where, the, you know, where inventions were happening, where toys were being you know, conceived, I mean, that was a really great atmosphere you know, to grow up in. Lynn Goldfarb and her two siblings got to be the first to play with their dad's inventions, but they were sworn to secrecy from talking about them with their friends. You never show anybody till it's out, because otherwise, you know, it could get stolen, who knew? Lynn, a filmmaker, even made a documentary about her dad a few years ago, following his journey. This is the bubble gun in action. If you had to sort of attribute his longevity and his continued mental acuity to anything. What do you think he's doing that's helping him with all of that? He is an eternal optimist. 3D printing is one of Eddie's latest obsessions, including creating lithophanes, intricate three-dimensional portraits that he makes on his 3D printer. He makes them for the people he loves and sometimes for Sunday morning correspondence. Should I be smiling? What's the With problem? a short interruption for a photo shoot, it was time to get back to playing Kerplunk. Hey. Oh, my God. That, you know, I'm a natural. Okay. That was pretty good. Okay, so now yeah. you for it. Oh, oh, you gave me a lot of marbles. Oh, those are yours? Oh. In fact, Eddie Goldfarb still has all his marbles, you might say, and a remarkably positive outlook as he enters his second century of life. You have to be an optimist. But I also tell people you have to love rejection. Every idea that you have, you think is going to be the next big thing. Oh, yeah. I, th I think they're going to be big items, yeah. It was actually a small item from Eddie that arrived at my house some weeks later. 
it was that lithophane portrait of me he'd promised to make. Just another example of Eddie Goldfarb brightening somebody's day. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.